He first saw her when she walked by his table in that little pub. Her long black hair moving with the sway of her hips. And when she turned around and looked at him with eyes as green as sea glass washed ashore, he knew he had to make her his wife. And he did. Just three short months later, they were married and he bought a chocolate box sized house on the edge of the village with large green pasture. He was so excited. They were married, it was their wedding day. She was moving into the house, his wife, his bride. And she was so beautiful. As they moved his things in, they finished up, had a little bite to eat under a tree, crusty bread, some wine and cheese. And then they moved in her items, some clothing, some shoes, a few books, and a spinning wheel. She didn't have much, had no family, and he was happy to give her a home. As he carried in the spinning wheel, he headed towards the one extra bedroom that that little house had. And she said, wait, she said, I don't have much. And I'd really like the spinning wheel to be on my side of the bed and to be in the bedroom. And he said, well, we have an extra room and until we have a baby, why don't we just put it in there? She said, I am not going to ask much of you as my husband, but this request I'll be persistent on. It's my only real belonging. He looked at her, her long hair, beautiful face, porcelain skin, and could deny her nothing. Fine, he said, put it beside the bed. And so together they lifted it and moved it onto her side of the bed. While the rest of the day was good, they swept and cleaned. He surveyed the land and began to plan their gardens. And they had a good dinner of stew. And then it was time for bed. He ran into the bedroom and got ready for bed, laid down, covered up, threw back the sheets on her side, patted the bed and said, my darling wife, come to bed. He was so excited to hold her. But she looked at him and she said, my sweet husband, I've never had a family before. I've never had a home, let alone a husband. Everything is so new. Just for tonight, I'm, I'm going to stay up late. You go to sleep. I'm restless. I can't sleep. <sighs> Fine, he said. I understand. She walked around the bed and came over to his side, leaned down and kissed him on the forehead. He could smell the scent of lavender in her hair, and he took a deep sigh. She said, I know. I'll tell you what, I'll sing you to sleep, just tonight. I'll sing you to sleep, and that'll help. The man closed his eyes, and he listened as his new wife began to sing. Eyes close, night falls, stars blink. A warning. Moon glows on silent night. No one knows my wanting. <sighs> the man was fast asleep. The next morning he awoke, laying on his side in a fetal position, his eyes opened slowly and he thought, I have not slept that well in so long. And then he remembered my wife. He turned and reached over to touch her. And as he turned his body to gaze upon her, his hand felt heat and his eyes saw fire looking back at him. Her eyes green were now ablazed in red, veins up her neck pulsating across her forehead, pus in her eyes, her mouth drawn back sharply, her hands clawed up in balls of fists with veins pulsating up through the fingers, her hair sweaty sticking to her face. He looked at her and he said, my wife, what is wrong? Nothing, she said, nothing, go to work. He said, my wife, something has to be wrong. If you're sick, tell me. If there's something you're dealing with, tell me so I can fix it. Nothing, nothing is wrong, she said. Go to work. 
The man slipped out of bed, put on his work clothes, backed out of the room. His wife, the whole time laying there, panting in a bed full of sweat. And he went to work. The whole day fretting, worrying, thinking, till it was time to go home. He walked home at a quick pace. And as the little house became clear in front of him, he saw that in the doorway was his wife. And the closer he got, the lighter his step. Oh, her long hair freshly washed, hung down, smiling face, smooth skin, arms outstretched, and he fell into them, kissed her at that sweet spot that she loved to be kissed at, nestled his face into her hair, took a deep breath, and then leaned back and gazed upon her face. My wife, you're okay. Of course I'm okay. I told you everything was fine. It's just a bad dream. They went in and they had a lovely dinner. The conversation was lively, a lot of laughter, and he was excited to go back to bed. When the time came, he slid into the bed and pulled down her side of the sheets and said, my wife, come lay with me. Mm, she said, I, uh, I know I said it would only be one night, but I'm still struggling. Everything's so new. Everything, the house, the land, now we have a cow, I have a husband. It just, it's still all so strange to me. Just one more night, just give me one more night. And I promise tomorrow night, I'll come to bed with you. She patted around the bed and leaned over him and kissed him softly on the forehead. He smelled the lavender and as she leaned back, he looked upon her face and thought, my wife is so beautiful. Fine, I can deny you nothing, he said. Fine, she said, I'll sing you to sleep again. The man said, okay. And so he closed his eyes and she sang again. Eyes close, night falls. Stars blink, a warning. Moon glows on silent night. No one knows my wanting. <sighs> and the man <sighs> fell fast asleep. The next morning, he woke, the sun streaming through the window onto his face, and he thought, he reached over and before he could turn, he felt it. The bed damp with sweat and as he jerked his eyes towards his wife, there she was. Pus coming out of her eyes, fiery blaze within. Her hair sticking to her face and her neck, her hands balled up with veins pulsating. And he said, my wife, just tell me what is wrong and I will fix it. He said, nothing. Nothing is wrong, she said. You have to be sick. Just tell me and I'll get what you need, he said. Nothing. Get to work. Nothing is wrong. So the man slid out of bed, put on his clothing, and went to work. The next day, same thing. The next day, same thing. Welcomed home by his lovely wife, a lovely meal, great conversation, bedtime, she'd sing, he'd wake up, and there she was. Finally, the man couldn't take it any longer, and he knew in the back of his mind that this was more than a sickness. He went to the foreman at the mill and he said, sir, he said, you know, I'm a good worker. He said, but my wife, she's sick and I need to go see somebody on her behalf. Oh, the foreman said. Your wife, she's a good one. She's a good looking woman. Go, you can go. I won't even dock your pay. You're a newlywed. Go, get the help that you need for your wife. And so the man left the mill. But instead of going to the doctors, he went down the road towards the edge of the village, out off onto the dirt road. He followed it straight until he saw the pile of rocks that marked the spot, letting people know 
how to get to where they needed to be. He made a sharp turn there and followed a straight path deep through the grass, deep into the woods, deep into the dark, until the little house rose up before him. He went up and he knocked on the door. The door opened and there she was, the conjure woman. Hello, can I help you? Yes, my wife, I, I'm, I'm newly married and she's sick and I need help and I, I don't think it's a typical sickness, he said. Oh, come in, come in, she said. Took him by the arm and let him in. Sit down, sit down, I'll make you something warm to drink, <laughs> she said. So the man sat down and the conjure woman made him something warm to drink. And then she pulled out the chair and sat across from him and said, Tell me your story. It weighs heavy on you. I see it. Tell me your story. And he did. And he talked about his wife, how beautiful she was. How every evening he'd come home from work, how they would eat, how they would go to bed, how she would sing, and how she would wake up. <laughs> the conjure woman looked at him and smiled with one eye open. <laughs> You've done married a boo hag. <gasps> What? A boo hag? What is a boo hag? Oh, a boo hag is a demon. And that skin she's in that you love so much, that beautiful skin, it's not hers. She spins it off each night and it's borrowed. It's borrowed. And they fly through the night, sucking up the breath of dreams from people. <laughs> you done married a boo hag. The man was furious. He pushed the table. His chair knocked over behind him. He stood up and he said, you, you are a crazy woman. I should have never came here. My wife, a boo hag. My wife is beautiful and she is kind. And as he turned to run out of that little conjure woman's house, she grabbed him with a strength that he couldn't even believe and pulled him back in and said, listen, tonight, <laughs> you don't believe me? Put cotton in your ears, boy. Don't listen to the song. And when she's done, watch. <laughs> and tell me what you see. Come back and tell me what you see. The man jerked his arm away and he ran out through the woods, through the grass, to the dirt road. <sighs> A boo hag. The woman's crazy. He's crazy. He ran back in towards the village, past the mill, and towards his house. And there it was. That perfect little chocolate box house. And in the doorway, filling the frame, was his wife. Long, dark hair, freshly washed. Beautiful green jeweled eyes, porcelain skin. Her arms lifted to welcome him home. He fell into her arms, took a deep breath and said, my wife, you're okay, you're okay. She said, of course I'm okay. As he held her there, holding her longer than normal, he thought in his mind, racing thoughts, a boo hag. It's ridiculous, my wife, a boo hag. And then he kissed her at that spot she loved so much. And he noticed that her ear seemed lower than the day before. <laughs> Crazy, he thought. My wife, what's for dinner? She said, oh, she said, carrots, potatoes, and stew, and a crusty bread that I made fresh this morning. They sat down, they ate, the conversation was lively. He was enjoying his stew, eating and savoring each bite, looking at his beautiful wife. And then he noticed, as she lifted her spoon to her mouth, that the wrinkles that should be above the knuckles slid back. The man put his head down and tried not to look shocked. Could it be, he thought. Could my wife be a boo hag? They ate and he, he helped her clean up. And when it was time for bed, he got ready, slipped his nightshirt over his body, and off of the bottom pulled two small strips of that cotton fabric and tucked it deep in his ears. When he went to bed, he saw his wife come in and he said, my sweet wife, he said, tonight, he said, I'm going to surprise you. He said, I need you to sing to me. He said, I don't feel well. Oh, she said, of course I will. She came over and kissed him on the forehead. 
and he watched as she backed away from the bed and sang, He couldn't hear her. But he could see. And he acted as if he drifted off. <laughs> and he turned on his side and he pulled out the cotton. <laughs> He heard the last strain of the last note of the song. And then he heard his wife pad around the bed. And then he heard the wooden seat of the spinning wheel creak as she settled in. And then he heard a sound that he'd never heard before. side and the sound stopped and then it began again the man slowly opened one eye to see what was making the strange noise and he saw it his wife it sitting on the spinning wheel, arm outstretched, and thin, glistening, pink, threaded flesh moving through the spinning wheel. <laughs> Slowly unraveling up her body, down her face, down her torso, until nothing was left but pulsating muscle. The boo hag stood up from the spinning wheel and moved towards the window. He could see her black hair sticking to the raw muscle of her back. She lifted the sash, crouched up in the window sill, and looked out into the night, whoo, and flew away. Aye! He could hear her as she flapped into the night. The man laid there pinned by fear, shocked at what he had just seen. And then he remembered, she'll be back. He slid out of bed, went around the side of the bed towards the spinning wheel and looked at his wife's pile of pink flesh laying in a soft mound on the floor. He slipped on clothing and ran out of the house to the edge of the village, to the dirt road. He ran until under the moonlight he could see that pile of rocks. He turned and made a straight beeline through the grass, through the green part of the forest into the deep dark until the house rose up before him and he knocked on the door. The door opened and she said, <laughs> I told you so. He ran in almost knocking her over and he said, you were right. Tell me, tell me what you saw. <laughs> I want to know. And he told her everything. What do I do, he said. I don't want her to come back. Just tell me what I need to do. And she told him, hmm. you want to nail all the windows shut except one. And then leave one sash open and take your woodworking tools. Do you have woodworking tools? Of course I am, I am a man, he said. And it's imperative for the story, they're in my shed. Good, she said, I'm so happy to hear that. She said, take your woodworking tools and make rough the wood around that one open window and then grab some blue paint. Do you have blue paint? Yes, I do, said the man. She said, grab the blue paint and paint all the window sills the whole way around blue with paint and around the door and then go in and put salt on her skin. Make sure you do this before the sun comes up <laughs> and then come back and tell me what you have and what you see and what happens. The man ran out of the house through the dark woods, through the green woods, out onto the dirt road, turned at the stones, ran in to his yard, went around into the shed, pulled out his woodworking tools and nailed every window shut. And then he painted blue around every window and around the front door, went inside and locked it, went to the back and locked the back door. Then he went into the kitchen. He got some salt out of a crock and he got a wooden spoon and he went into the bedroom, went around to the side of the bed to where his wife's skin lay. He poured the salt 
on the mound of skin, pushed the crock under the bed, took the spoon, put it in the skin, and began to stir. And pulled the spoon out. And then he went into the bed, covered up, and he waited. And then he heard her. Ay! She was coming. Ay! She was coming. Whoo! He heard her hit the side of the house, trying to open a window. Ay! She screamed whoop, like raw meat on a butcher's block. She was slapping against the side of the house, banging on the windows until finally he heard her where she had found the window that was partially open. And as she pulled her raw muscled body through that opening, the jagged wood ripped and tore at the pulsating muscle. He heard her land with a thud on the floor, come running down the hall, and then she leapt whoosh over the bed. He could feel the heat from her body as she crossed over and she landed with a thud boof, on the side of the bed on the floor. She stood there looking at him, hate filling her eyes as she began to try and pull the skin up over her body. The raw cuts wide open, the salt sinking in. Ay! She screamed, looking at him with pure murder in her eyes. And as she tried to pull her skin up, the salt entered the wounds. She could barely take it. Ay! She cried and she couldn't pull it up. The pain was too much. And then, whew, the sun tinged the sky with a rose pink and it filtered through the window and landed on the boo hag whose skin was not completely on and poof, she was gone. And thin gray paper pieces of skin landed like snow confetti to the ground. The man pulled the blanket off, walked around the bed and looked at what was left of his wife. He went and got a dustpan and a broom and he cleaned her up. And then he jimmied open the window and blew her back to wherever she came. Well, he told people that she'd left to go be with some family members that were sick. Talk around town was, we heard she didn't have family. She was too pretty for him, but we should have known. And he didn't mind the idle chatter that he knew happened behind his back. He didn't care at all. When she did not show up, people knew that she had really left, but they didn't say anything out of being polite. And he sold that little chocolate box house and he bought a farm on the other side of that village. And he got some animals and he was content living alone. He told people, he said, no, 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 no. He said, no wife for me. I'll never get married again. They couldn't blame him. But never say never. The town grew and a baker moved to town and with him, a lovely assistant. She was a fine woman, stocky, built like a tree trunk. Plain of face, but smart. A quick, sarcastic humor, and boy, could she bake. And it wasn't long till she caught the eye of the farmer. Hmm. And they courted. And people would say, is there anything strange about him? You know, his first wife left him. No, nothing at all, she'd say. He's a fine man, a hardworking man. She said, nothing strange, except once in a while, he pinches my cheek a little bit too hard. <laughs> I don't mind, she said. And soon they were married. And she moved in to the little farmhouse. And things were good. They had a child. Now, for the first few weeks, the child stayed beside the bed, constant attention from parents that rarely slept. But then the child was moved to the extra bedroom. Finally, they had some peace. Her head was on his chest when they heard the baby begin to squeal and then cry. He moved to get up. She said, no, 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 no. I'll, I'll get the baby. You have to work tomorrow. And she slid out of bed and went into that little room. And he listened, his heart full and content. My wife is a good woman. And he closed his eyes. As she listened to his wife, shush, 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 the baby. And then she began to sing a lullaby. Eyes closed. 
night falls. Stars blink a warning. Moon glows on silent night. No one knows my wanting. Did you enjoy that story? Of course you did. Like they said, if you want to put a contribution in, go to the hat beneath the story on worldstorytellingcafe.com. And, well, you remember the song? Buddy, can you spare me a dime? Well, I'm sure every storyteller would appreciate a little in the hat. I'm going to pass it round. Thank you, sir. Thank you, madam. That That's most appreciated. Whoa! Whoa! Oh! 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 No, that is fantastic. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, he, even better. He, oh, ladies and gentlemen, that you you have done. Uh, just a little rattle there. Just a little rattle. And uh, oh, my hat is nearly full. And that storyteller you've just listened to will eat for a few days because we're all stuck without being able to go out and perform. And we love you all, and we love the fact that you've listened to the stories. And if you can afford it, buddy, can you spare me a dime?